Welcome back, this is Chris. Date today is July 9th, 2016, year of our Savior. Title is Priestcraft, Priestcraft Nave. N-A-V-E, Nave, or Navel. Good, good uh, reference there. So Priestcraft Nave. Now, I know this, there's a lot of detail here, but understand that Satan is the god of this world, and he has this very complex system going on. And you might have people going, well, wait a minute, you said the flower of life, is, that's found in nature, okay? But understand that Satan knows all about God's creation, a lot of it. So what he does is he corrupts it, he uh, scribes and takes credit for it, he makes sexual connotations out of it, okay? That's how he operates. Now, when we see that the, uh, I was talking about Christian symbolism, we have uh, the, the ichthys, we have uh, the five Greek, letter, uh, Greek letters forming the fish, we have I, X, O, Y, I'm doing my best here, but basically it says that the, uh, well, these have 27 letters, which means 3 times 3 times 3, which is that age indicates power. So it also has a cultic reference. A lot of times people get into, caught up in these, well, it's a Christian symbol, but understand that it has a pagan symbol beyond that to the esoteric, to the initiated, to the illuminated. So remember that the Vesca Pisces or the Ichthys placed on ancient cathedrals and churches during the medieval period in the form of Shilana gigs was used to what? It was used to ward off evil spirits. This was known as apotropaic magic and the purpose of this specific magic was to ward off harm, misfortune, and evil influences. So the honky punks in the Shilana gigs, a figurative carvings of naked women displaying an exaggerated vulva, were designed to frighten away witches, demons, and other malign or evil in nature influences. That's not Christian, folks. That's pagan. Now, church buildings, the members metaphorically enter into the vulval or vulvar vestibule of the vulva, representing the mother goddess called the narthex, being an entrance into a cavity or unfilled space within a mass. The vestibule is a lobby, foyer, or entrance into a hallway called the nave. Definition of nave, excuse me, is a medieval Latin uh, from the Latin meaning ship, the main part of the interior of a church, especially the long, narrow central hall in a cruciform, which means forming or arranging in a cross church that rises higher than the aisles, flanking it to form a clerestory or an outside wall of a room or building carried above an adjoining roof and pierced with windows and a gallery. And that's taken under Nave, page 564, New Collegiate Dictionary. Now, if you're looking at the, uh, the illustration in a, in a uh, cross formation of a, of a temple, you find that the Nave consists up to the, where you have the altar rail. In Roman asking Gothic Christian uh, Abbey or Cathedral Basilica and Church Architecture, the nave is the main body of the church. It provides the central approach to the high altar. The nave extends from the entry, which may have a separate vestibule, the narthex, to the chancel and may be flanked by the lower side aisles. If the aisles are high and of a width comparable to the central nave, the, the structure is sometimes said to have three naves. The term nave is from the medieval Latin navis, or ship. A ship was an early Christian symbol. The term may also have been suggested by the keel shaped of the vaulting of a church. In many Scandinavian and Baltic countries, a model ship is commonly found hanging in the nave of the church. And in some languages, the same word means both nave and ship, as for instance, the Danish skip or the Swedish skep. The earliest churches were built when the founders were familiar with the form of the Roman Basilica, which is an ancient Roman public building where courts were held. 
a public building for business transactions. It had a wide central area with aisles separated by columns and with windows near the ceiling. Old St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is an early church which had this form. Now, Old St. Peter's Basilica was the Old St. Peter's Basilica was the building that stood from the 4th to the 16th centuries on the spot where the new St. Peter's Basilica stands today in Vatican City. Construction of the basilica built over the historical site of the Circus of Nero began during the reign of Emperor Constantine I. Now, it was built in the 4th century in the orders of Roman Emperor Constantine I and replaced in the 16th century. So it was built on a sacred site. Now we see that the nave, the main body of the building, is a section set apart for the laity, while the chancel is reserved for the clergy. In the medieval churches, the nave was separated from the chancel by the rood screen, the, these being elaborately decorated were notable features in European churches from the 4th, 14th to the mid 16th century. Now what is a rood screen? Okay, also called the choir screen, the chancel screen, or the jube, is a common feature in late medieval church architecture, typically an ornate partition between the chancel and the nave. Medieval naves were divided into bays, the repetition of form giving an effect of great, of great was emphasized during the Renaissance, in place of dramatic effects, there were more balanced proportions. So basically what you're doing is you're entering the church building through the vestibule. It has two sets of doors. Now you're entering into the, you're entering into the nave is, you're entering into the, the vagina, which is, a, which is a, um, a cavity. It's like a canal or hallway. And that's where only the laity reside, generally speaking. Conceptually speaking, that's where the laity reside in the vaginal canal. Now only, then you get up to the, uh, the altar rail and only what? Only the clergy that have gone through what? Gone through seminary, They've gone through seminary. <laughs> they are the seed, only they can go through uh, the cervix, shall we say, or the altar rail into the womb and that's where the magic happens, okay? That's where the transubstantiation, transubstantiation happens. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but so that you're following along, it's, it can be very technical. Now, the laity reside in the nave. Now they're in the church building. Now, laity, noun from lay, subscript number five, number one, the people of a religious faith as distinguished from its clergy. Number two, the mass of people as distinguished from those of a particular profession or those specially skilled. All right, now that's where you get, uh, that's laity, uh, page 472. Now, lay is linked to laity. Subscript number five says, from the Greek, laikos of the people from laos, or like where you have the word laos, people. Number one, of or relating to the laity, not ecclesiastical. They're not part of the clergy, they're not part of the organized religious system, they're not part of the sacerdotal, they're not the mediators between God and the people. They are the people, they're at the bottom line, and they have to go through the priesthood to have access to God. Now, number two is other relating to members of a religious house occupied with domestic or manual work. Number three, not or of or from a particular profession. They're unprofessional, public or common. And then uh, mass, subscript number four says of or relating to the mass of people. So let's do a little review here. The nave is the location of the temple where the laity or the laos or the lay person or the unprofessional, not ecclesiastical, not clergy or mass of people reside. The nave is referring to the central part or point of anything, specifically the middle. The nave and architecture is the middle or body of a church extending from the transept to the principal entrance. The transept is the part of a cruciform church that crosses at right angles to the greatest length between the nave and the apse or choir, and the principal entrance is referring to the vestibule or entrance to a cavity. All right.
So what we have is you enter into the church is laid out in a cruciform pattern. So you enter into the church and you're going down the long aisle, okay? And then you get to the crossbar forming, forming. Now on the other side of that crossbar is, is where the altar is. That's where the clergy reside, okay? That's why you can only go to the transept area. And that's where you kneel before the priest, who's the mediator between God and the people, okay? Now, navel, uh, nave, from the Latin navis, or ship. Number one, in architecture, the middle or body of a church extending from the transepts to the principal entrance, which is the entrance, which is your vestibule. Number two, it also can mean hub of a wheel. Uh, the etymology is from Latin nav navis, or navis, and uh, that is referring to navel. It's referring to your umbio or shield or boss. It's referring to your umbilical cord, okay? And that's where you have also see nave, uh, navy. You get navy as well. So it's referring to your navel, your umbilical cord on your body. So etymologically, nave or navel or navel are akin or related by blood similar descended from a common ancestor or cognate to each other revealing more insight to the use of the word nave to represent the middle or midriff of the temple navel noun mid-english from the old english nephela akin to old high german nabalo or navel latin umbilicus or greek umphalus Number one, a depression in the middle of the abdomen marking the point of attachment of the umbilical cord or yoke stock. Number two, the central point or middle. This is all referring to the anatomical position on the woman's body, specifically her re reproductive area. Okay. Now, umbilicus, now Latin, more at navel. They're related. Number one, a small depression in the abdominal wall at that point of attachment of the umbilical cord to the embryo, a central point or core. Then you have umbilical, uh, adjective, of or relating to or used at the navel, of or relating to the central region of the abdomen. Navel comes from the Latin umbilicus, and the Latin comes from the Greek omphalus. Omphalus is a religious stone, artifact, or uh, Betelus in the Greek word omphalos means navel, coming full circle here. Uh, in Greek lore, Zeus sent two eagles across the world to meet at its center, the navel of the world. Omphalos stones marking the centra were erected in several places about the Mediterranean Sea. The most famous of those was at Delphi, as I mentioned earlier. Omphalos is also the name of the stone given to Kronos. In the ancient world of the Mediterranean, it was a powerful religious symbol. The Omphalos was not only an object of Hellenic or Greek religious symbolism and world centrality, it was also considered an object of power. Its symbolic reference included the uterus, the phallus, and a cup of red wine representing royal bloodlines. And that's taken from on phallus, Wikipedia, wikipedia.org. Now, Delphi was a sacred site in classical ancient Greece where supposedly Zeus found the navel referencing to the womb or on phallus of Gaia, who was the primal or first Greek mother goddess, creator and giver of life to the earth and all the universe. This was referred to as the navel of the earth. Delphi comes from the ancient Greek meaning womb. Quote, the navel clinically known as the umbilicus or colloquially known as the belly button or tummy button is a scar on the abdomen at the attachment site of the umbilical cord. All placental male mammals have a navel and is quite conspicuous in humans. And then we got, of course, the, uh, um, the actual medical location of it, but you can refer that, you can find that in Wikipedia under navel, spelled with N-A-V-E-L. So we see that the, um, the navel is the central of the circle in this drawing of the 
Vitruvian man by Leonardo da Vinci. Mm -hmm. The nave of the Christian temple layout is in reference to the navel of the mother goddess. This is why the word midriff is cognate with the word incorporate, as we mentioned earlier, or corporation, referring to the religious mother corporation coming from the Latin corpus, meaning body. It's all tied together. The midriff is a term used to describe the human abdomen. This is an old term in the English language. Notice the anatomical correlation to the word incorporate and midriff. Midriff of a woman. Incorporate uh, from Latin in plus corpore or corpus, body, more at midriff or abdomen. Number one, to unite thoroughly with or work indistinguishably into something already existent, to admit membership into a corporation, to blend or combine thoroughly to form a consistent whole. And this means to form into a legal corporation, to give material form, to embody, to unite in or as one body, to form or become a corporation. And we know that a body means to deprive of spiritually, to hand over to a spirit. Midriff. Now, mid-English, midriff, from the old English midriff, from middle or mid, plus hreff or belly, akin to the old high German hreff or body, Latin corpus. Now, number one, the mid-region of the human torso. Number two, a section of a woman's garment that covers the midriff, a woman's garment that exposes the midriff. Notice the midriff definition is focusing mainly on the feminine. Incorporate midriff on phallus, delphi, gaia, navel are all referencing the womb of the mother goddess and thus the word nave is derivative of this anatomical location on the female body. The mark of the navel on all humans is symbolic that we came from the womb of a woman, specifically our mother. The yoni in the Sanskrit literally means vulva, vagina, or womb, and is a symbol of the mother goddess Shakti or Gaya. She goes by many names depending on which culture or ancient civilization one is studying. The nave also has reference to the word ship and may symbolize the mother goddess Venus coming from the water. Both Ichthys and Pisces are icons representing the mother goddess's vulva and also symbolize fish assisting the egg from heaven that landed in the water whence came the mother goddess. The fish as an ancient symbol represented female sexuality. The nave is the main part of the interior of a church where members of the parish or, or corporation reside. In the cruciform church, the nave is especially referenced to a long, narrow central hall that leads to a high altar in the chancel area where the clergy, only the clergy or skilled reside. The laity or unskilled typically reside in the nave location unless participating in choir or Eucharistic ceremony. Folks, remember that this all is centered around the Eucharist. It's all centered around the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So the anatomical correlation to the nave of a church is the vaginal cavity starting with the vulval vestibule and ending at the cervix or transept of the temple. Now a transept, what is a transept? Now we're getting into the transept. When you're looking at the cruciform part of the church, the transept, that's that crossbar right there. That's where the altar rail is. Now a transept with two semi-transepts is a transverse location of any building which lies across the main body of a building. In churches, a transept is an area set crosswise to the nave in a cruciform or cross-shaped building in Romanesque and Gothic Christian churches. The transept of a church separates the nave from the sanctuary, ass, choir, shevet, presbytery, or chancel. So this basically, this separates, the transept separates where the clergy reside, where the altar resides, and where the laity reside. Okay? 
The transept crosses the nave at the crossing, which belongs equally to the main nave access and to the transept. Um, since the altar is located at the east end of a church and a transept extends to the north and south, the north and south end walls are often hold decorated windows of stained glass such as rose windows in a stone transfer. Remember that you enter through the vestibule, that's west end, and you're moving down the nave. You get the cross section where you have the altar rail, okay? And that's your transept, and then you go beyond that, usually stairs leading up to the altar, specific, and that's the Holy of Holies in the temple location, okay? That's all Old Testament, folks. And so... When you're dealing with the cathedral groundwork, the shaded area is the transept. Darker shading represents the crossing. Now, the transept divides the nave or laity section from the chancel or clergy location. The sanctuary, asp, choir, or shevet, and presbyteria or chancel are located in the ecclesiastical section of the temple. The sanctuary is the all area where the altar is located. It is considered holy because of the physical presence of God in the Eucharist, both during the Mass and in the tabernacle on the altar the rest of the time. Transept in your Greek and your uh, English dictionary, page 940, states, Noun, new, uh, new Latin transeptum from Latin trans plus septum or septum enclosure or wall. Excuse me. The part of a cruciform church that crosses at right angles to the greatest length between the nave and the apse or choir, also either of the projecting ends of a transept. Now we're going to get into all this is borrowed from Rome, folks. This is all borrowed from paganism because remember that we're God's temple. So the Holy Spirit arrives in us. We're the Holy of Holies. That's in our bodies. But then we go, oh, no, no, you have to go to this building. You got to enter through the vestibule, the vulvar vestibule. Oh, how how uh, how uh, smart Satan is, allow us to participate in that. And above the vestibule, we look directly up, and there we got, we got the steeple, right? And then we enter in through another door, and then we're in the nave, referring to the nave or the midriff section. You're inside this area, you're in the vagina, you're in that cavity, and that's only where you can reside. Sit there as a good communicant, right? Sit there as a good church member, and just listen to whatever your pastor said, and then come forward to the altar row where you kneel before your master, right? You kneel before your mediator. Where is that in the New Testament? Mm -hmm. Not there. Okay. It's barred from paganism. Okay? See, there a lot of times people go, where do you go? Uh, um, where do you go? What church do you go to? Stephen, what coat church do you go to? It's in my heart. That's right. I go, uh, it's like asking me, where do I go? Well, I go to I go to Chris. Because mm -hmm. I am part of the church. Wherever mm -hmm. I go, that's where the church is. Amen. With other people. I'm not saying I'm the only church person, okay? But I'm the ecclesia, and when I'm ecclesia, I'm also the clergy. We all are through mm -hmm. faith in Christ. Unless you choose to be part of this mother church or daughter corporation where you're cut off from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're getting into Mariolatry. This is all mother goddess worship. Mariolatry, Mariolatry is the Christian temple layout is based upon the concept of Mariolatry. Roman Marian churches or cathedrals were dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mariolatry, noun, excessive veneration of the Virgin Mary. That's page 517 in your Collegiate Dictionary. Mary, uh, Mariol Mariology, noun, study or doctrine relating to the Virgin Mary. That's page 517 as well in your Collegiate Dictionary. Marius, or, uh, noun, a priest of the Roman Catholic Church, Catholic Society of Mary, founded in France in 1816 and devoted to education. Marius, page 517 in your Collegiate Dictionary. Mary, an adjective, number one, of or relating to Mary Tudor or her reign, 1553 to 1558, or number two, of or relating to the Virgin Mary. Marian, page 517 in your Collegiate Dictionary. A Marianist. Now, a priest or brother of the Roman Catholic Society of Mary of Paris devoted especially to education. Yeah, they're all in our educational facilities, folks. 
Um, that's page 517. So, quote, Roman Catholic veneration of Mary, mother of Jesus, includes prayer, pious acts, visual arts, poetry, and music devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Popes have encouraged it while also taking steps to reform some manifestations of it. The Holy See has insisted on the importance of distinguishing true from false devotion and authentic uh, doctrine from its deformations by excess or defect. There are significant, significantly more titles, feast, and venerative Marian practices among Roman Catholics than in any other Catholic traditions. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. The term uh, hyperdulia indicates the special veneration due to Mary, which is nothing more than mother goddess worship, folks, greater than the ordinary dulia for other saints. But utterly unlike the latria due only to God, Mariolatry is a Protestant prerogative for perceived excessive Catholic devotion to Mary, end quote. Now, they say that, oh, as a Protestant, well, that's perceived devotion to Mariolatry. Folks, worshiping Mother Goddess is not a part of biblical Christianity unless you're sinning from God, uh, worshiping the Queen of Heaven, which God hates, okay? Continuing the quote, belief in the incarnation of God, the Son through Mary, is the basis for calling her the Mother of God. This expression is found in the prayers such as the sub tuum praesidium, dated from the third or no later than the fourth century. Uh, and was declared a dogma at the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD, and at the Second Vatican Council and Pope John Paul II's encyclical, she is spoken of also as a mother of the church. End quote. That's taken from Wikipedia, Veneration of Mary and Roman Catholicism. This is all Mother Goddess worship. It's very complex, but if you understand that we need to come to Jesus, only Jesus, not Mother Goddess worship. God bless you. Thank you.